Why would CNN or any major media outlet want to trash a film about child sex trafficking and by extension to minimize the global horror as, well, it's really just no big deal. In this episode of Ideas Have Consequences, I'll connect the dots for you. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're going to be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. And you seem pretty familiar with him because he doesn't really hide his association with this real wild plot uh, that that involves, you know, drinking the blood of children and things like that. No, he doesn't hide it at all. And you have a lot of people who are in this world of QAnon who say, oh, they don't know what that is. They've never heard of it. They're just asking questions. With somebody like Jim Caviezel, he is openly embracing it. He's openly using its catchphrases and its concepts. He's speaking at QAnon conventions. And this film is being marketed to either specific QAnon believers or to people who believe all of the same tenets as QAnon but claim they don't know what it is. And The Sound of Freedom does focus on a real issue of sex trafficking. Uh, but that theme, it, it's sort of like that kernel of truth that feeds the QAnon conspiracy theory. Uh, tell us how those two things work together. Sure. And the most durable and the most believable conspiracy theories are not entirely false. There's something in them that is true and the rest of it is false. But the believers point to the one true thing and they say, oh, you don't believe that this particular thing is true. In terms of child trafficking, we know trafficking is real. We know it has real victims. No one is denying that. But these films are created out of moral panics. They're created out of bogus statistics. They're created out of fear. And with something like Sound of Freedom, it specifically is looking at QAnon concepts of these child trafficking rings that are run by the high-level elites and only people like Tim Ballard and only people like Jim Caviezel and by extension only people like the ticket buyer can help bring these trafficking rings down. So there's a very participatory element. You're not just going to see a movie, you're just killing two hours on a hot day. You are helping bring down these, these pedophile rings and save children. Now it's not true, but it's a very comforting and it's a very warm feeling to have. Incredible. That was CNN. This is CNN. That was CNN. And that's CNN's take on the blockbuster film Sound of Freedom, a film that is about child sex trafficking. It stars uh, Jim Caviezel, Miro Savino, Bill Camp, Eduardo Verasky, who, by the way, was in a film that I love, a terrific Film. I, I got to believe that guy is a Christian because uh, the kind of films that he chooses to be in, a film called Bella, I really, really strongly recommend that you watch the film Bella, which takes on the issue of abortion. But this film, Sound of Freedom, is it's a very powerful film. I saw it last week 
And, uh, and it has obviously enraged the left, all the more so because the film is topping the box office in films like the new Indiana Jones movie. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seem to be too toxic. At Tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at Tomap.com, and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. Now, what I want to do in today's podcast is I want to discuss not just the film and child sex trafficking, but the media response to the film and the war on children in general, because that's that really is the big issue. So let's look at a couple of the headlines about Jim Caviezel's film. The first is the Washington Post. Now, the Washington Post has become a rag. It has. And I, I say that the Washington Post has always been left-leaning, but now it's just radical leftist, which is to say that it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, they're not searching for truth at all. The Washington Post has, you know, trashed me. So trust me, I know a little, little bit about the Post. But, you know, the Post back in the day, you know, Woodward and Bernstein, you know, guys who were searching for the truth, Watergate, you know, all that stuff. Not anymore. Here's the headline. QAnon and Sound of Freedom both rely on tired Hollywood tropes. This was published July 15, so not that long ago. So the film was already already a, um, a, a, a phenomenon at the box office, but they feel the need to come out and tell you, hey, don't watch it. Not worth, not worth seeing this. Then you have Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone is another rag. Rolling Stone used to be fun. You know, it was a long time ago, but, and again, they were left-leaning, but they were at least fun. You know who used to write for Rolling Stone, who I love, is a personal favorite writer of mine, P.J. O'Rourke. P.J. O'Rourke used to write for Rolling Stone. And P.J. O'Rourke was anything but a radical leftist. He wasn't a Christian, but P.J. O'Rourke was an economist. An economist, by definition, if they're any good, are conservative. And he was hilarious. Anyway, Rolling Stone's headline, Sound of Freedom is a superhero movie for dads with brain worms. Superhero movie for dads with brain worms. What the hell is wrong with these people? I mean... This is, this is what they're putting out here. And then you have, of course, what we began with, a CNN interview with a guy named Mike Rothschild. Do you know, you know what his specialty is? What his qualifications are? He's a conspiracy theory specialist. Conspiracy theory specialist. <laughs> I think the guy himself is peddling a conspiracy theory about a fake conspiracy theory. QAnon is a media invention. It is a media invention. It is, it is a fake thing that they have created to say this is the white supremacy threat. This is the fascist threat. It isn't to say that there aren't some weird corners of Twitter or wherever that they can dig up somebody who has some of these ideas. But I will promise you, 
I'm not offering evidence of this. I'm just offering you my opinion that there are loads of bots and fake accounts that are driving it, that are posting things that fit that narrative and that they're just entirely fake. They're just entirely fake. But Mr. Rothschild, who is a conspiracy theory specialist, is the guy that CNN has come on to explain how this is really all. Remember, did you catch what he said? He didn't just trash the film as QAnon conspiracy theory, but he went on to say, yeah, sex trafficking, it's a, it's a real thing. But based on bogus statistics, it's based on bogus statistics, and it's meant to just scare people. I wonder if Mr. Rothschild has spent any time whatsoever in the third world, as I have. If you do, you know that child sex trafficking is real. It is a big thing, and I'll get into that just a little bit later in the podcast. I wonder if he spent any time in third world orphanages. If he did, again, he would know that child sex trafficking is real. It is not a conspiracy theory. It is not based on bogus statistics. But I was trying to picture Mr. Rothschild being brought on to CNN after, let's say, the film Schindler's List came out, in which he said, this is all QAnon, conspiracy theory. The Holocaust is all based on bogus statistics. It's meant to frighten people. Why? <laughs> The Nazis only killed a few hundred thousand Jews in gas chambers, not millions of them. This is just blown out of proportion. There's too much being made out of this. It's almost as if every major media outlet received a memo, and they did, <laughs> as they do on a number of other issues, instructing them to trash Sound of Freedom and reassure audiences that child sex trafficking is really just a bunch of nothing. I have been reading novelist Frederick Forsyth's memoir, The Outsider. And uh, Forsyth is a guy that I much admire. His, not just his novels, if you've read any of his novels, which you know, he hasn't published any in, in quite some time. He's very elderly. I think he's in his late 80s, maybe his early 90s. But Forsyth has led quite a life. You know, he was, he was um, you know, a child during World War II. He, he aspired to be in the, uh, the Royal Air Force. He ended up joining and, um, and uh, became a pilot. And uh, then he became a journalist. And in his capacity as journalist, he was covering some of the major events, you know, going on around the world. You know, the Six Day War in Israel, and his uh, his his meeting with guys like uh, Moshe Dayan and um, um, David Ben Gurion and um, De Gaulle and figures like this. It led to novels like um, The Day of the Jackal is 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 one of his famous novels, um, The Odessa File, numerous others, terrific, terrific writer. But he worked for BBC and Reuters, and he was fired by BBC. And um, here's what he said. He was talking about in the novel, and I had, to, I had to write this down. He was talking about, excuse me, in his memoir, not a novel. He was talking about how he was covering the war, the civil war in Nigeria in the early 1970s, and that BBC basically told him to publish lies. They did not like what he was saying and it, because it didn't support the, the state narrative. And, um, and, and here's what he said. I thought this was very quotable. He says, when a reporter is told by his employer, in this case BBC, to publish something he knows to be a pack of lies, there are only three things he can do. The first is look to his security, his salary, his pension pot, and do what he is told. The second is to sit in the corner blubbering his heart out at the unfairness of it all. The third is to raise a rigid middle finger at the lot of them and walk out. <laughs> and that's what he did. That's what he did. He said, I'm not doing this. I refuse to do this. Today, Today, we are lacking journalists with integrity. And, and, and this might be a good point for me to say um, many people 
want to say that I'm a journalist. Sometimes I see that in the comments. Sometimes I see that in uh, responses on Twitter, um, you know, characterizations of my interviews. I want to be very clear. I am not a journalist. I'm not a journalist. I actually take that as a slight insult. <laughs> and, uh, and it is because maybe I wouldn't have taken it as an insult if the journalistic community were made up of Frederick Forsyth's. But I don't know of any journalist personally that has integrity. Having been interviewed by a host of them from the Atlantic to BBC, I've watched them all do the New Yorker. Uh, I've watched, I've watched how they work. I've watched how they do publish a pack of lies. I watch how they rig interviews. I've been a part of those interviews. And it isn't to say that every journalist does that. They don't all do that. There are journalists with integrity, but I am a writer. I'm a writer. My background is not that of a journalist. I actually was trained in a real field, in an academic field, which is different. So um, I don't want to be lumped together with guys like these people that you see on CNN, like you see in, in these headlines with the Washington Post that you see with the Rolling Stone. What a joke. What an absolute joke these people are. Again, it's like they all got the memo. This is what you're going to say. I think they did. But let's give credit where credit is due. Surprisingly, Variety's review was an exception. Here's their headline. Sound of Freedom Review. Jim Caviezel anchors a solidly made and disquieting thriller about child sex trafficking. Uh, in his review of the film, Owen Gleiberman, who, by the way, does make the obligatory absurd statements about uh, this is you know a lot of conspiracy theory and this kind of thing. But when you get to the heart of his review, he, what he says is excellent. He says this, how many movies and TV shows have we all seen about drug trafficking? Too many. Child sex trafficking, by contrast, isn't a subject that lends itself to entertainment. But as Sound of Freedom informs us, it's the fastest growing international criminal network the world has ever seen seen. A closing title states accurately that there are more people enslaved now by sex trafficking than there were when slavery was legal. And the nightmare lived by captured children is unspeakable, unimaginable, and all too real. Let's be clear. This matters more than the cocaine or opioids industry. Now that that's excellent. And that's from Variety. Lieberman also points out that the film is actually five years old. Did you know that? You didn't know that. But you you did know that. It's five years old. It was it was made in 2018 by guess who? Disney. And Disney was woke in 2018, but nothing like where they are now. And my guess is that they saw it in for whatever reason, they decided, probably because it didn't fit their agenda, they shelved it. They shelved the film. And I mean, Disney is about as, uh, Disney is pushing the pedophile agenda more than anybody. So for Disney to produce a film about child sex trafficking, I'm sure somebody said, whoa, 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 we don't, let's not, let's not release this film. So they mothballed it. And it was eventually resurrected and um, distributed as a result of crowdfunding. Uh, people got together, raised the money, and distributed this film. Glenn Beck, let's, 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 let's credit Glenn Beck for also putting some muscle um, behind this film. And so it was, it was independently released. And it's become a juggernaut. So Disney itself, I'm sure, is a little embarrassed by the fact that what they could have made money on, they didn't. So the film, again, has made, as of today, $85 million. It'll top $100 million easily and um, probably go well, well beyond that. But Child sex trafficking is a real issue. Now, there's another film that I want you to see. And in case, or, or rather, uh, a little video that I want you to see. And in case you think that these things are rare, I, I want to tell you that they're not. It just so happens that this was captured. Um, you know, the visual of this um, was, was captured. But this is, it, we're not told where this is, but it, it appears to me to be quite obviously in South America. And I'm guessing in Colombia. But let's let's watch this little video.
no sound. You just see a little girl who is at a vending stand and she's buying an ice cream or something. A guy uh, you see standing standing um, to the side. He appears to be on the phone, probably pretending to be on the phone, but he is definitely watching that little girl. Now, the woman comes out, you know, gives the girl change, but she is already noticing that guy standing there. And she notices that the car door is wide open, parked on the street. She keeps watching him. This woman is savvy. And this is the way women have to be in this, this part of the world. I promise you this. I've been in South America countless times, and you have got to be on your guard. Now, she's watching. So the little girl here, she's leaving, heading down the sidewalk. And this woman knows what is coming. And there you go. She just manages to stop that girl from being pushed into that car. Children just appear like this every day all over the world. As a result of this, the rest of that little video shows that woman coming back and getting out her phone and videoing the car because the car comes back down the street and she's videoing the car going down the street. She's trying to get a license plate, uh, a description of the vehicle, and then it shows her on the phone. But here's, here's uh, probably to the police, but here's the disturbing aspect of this. The police don't really care in those countries. They really don't. They will make a show of doing something, but they really don't do much of anything. But this particular video has a happy ending. We see the woman save the little girl. But I dare say that most of these instances, they don't have happy endings. These children just disappear. And because it's happening in the third world to people who do not have any influence or power or money, no one cares. No one does anything about it. Um, the Natalie Holloway instance of some years ago, who's from Alabama, you know, where we record this podcast, Natalie Holloway's parents, um, are from moneyed Mountain Brook, Alabama. Now, for those of you who don't know Mountain Brook, Mountain Brook is kind of the, you know, the posh Beverly Hills area of Birmingham, Alabama and uh, people with, with money. And I don't know the means of, of, of her family, but they must have something. And the point is, they were able to get people like, what's her name, Greta Sustern? Is that, that how you say her name? You get, get able to get her involved. And in, um, what's the other woman's name? Grace. Something Grace. Yes. Nancy Grace. Thank you so much. Um, got her involved. And there were multiple shows on this. Almost felt like a full season of Fox was just about Natalie Holloway. And they went to Aruba where she disappeared. They were able to bring tons of media attention to this story. That's with one girl. And by the way, I'm not begrudging that. Good for them. I would do the same and more if I could, if it were one of, one of my own children. I'm simply pointing out that because this is happening in the third world to children who don't live in Mountain Brooks, no one cares. These stories just aren't reported. Um, I will soon be in Nigeria where Christians are being slaughtered. Let me tell you, it is a terrifying place. I don't want to go. I've been there before. But because these are very, very poor, literally dirt poor people, and also because they're Christians, the stories just aren't making headlines here. They just aren't making headlines. Greta Thunberg gets headlines. These people don't. Now, I saw this film with my daughter, Sasha, and some of you will know a little bit about Sasha. Her story is contained in my first book, The Grace Effect, which I hope you will buy and read. Of all my books, by the way, this one is the one that is most dear to me. It wasn't the, it wasn't the most celebrated. Uh, my, my second book is the one that got all the headlines and the favorable reviews and you know, and also the one that was that was trashed um, by media. It was a mix. It was a little little bit of um, of both. Some didn't like the uh, the narrative there, but um, the Grace Effect is the one that has my heart in it, and it is telling the story of the dangers of socialism 
And I'm using my daughter, Sasha, who we were in the process of adopting from Ukraine as a vehicle to tell that story. You know, what was her like life like under living in orphanages under socialist principles, communist, old communist, um, socialist, Marxist, which is say atheistic principles. What was that like versus when she came to the United States in a culture that has been touched by grace? What was it like dealing with the Ukrainian government versus dealing with the United States government at that time? And that's been more than a decade now. And by the way, we have an upcoming podcast that we just recorded with Sasha, which is quite powerful. I think you'll, you'll want to see that. But I had mixed feelings about going to see this film with Sasha. And uh, Sasha's now, she's a mother. Um, she is uh, uh, a mother of a beautiful little girl who is here with us um, right now, in, in fact, six month old. And um, she's happily married and she's thriving. But these memories linger with her in a very big way. And that is because the orphanages, and she talks a little bit about this in the podcast that we do, the orphanages in Ukraine and in Russia, and no doubt throughout Eastern Europe and parts of the world, they are feeders for child sex traffickers. It's one of the, one of the, the biggest dirty secrets that is out there. Um, these children are rented out to people who have, you know, you want a little boy, you want a little girl, orphanage will rent you one for a little while. Do what you want. One of, Sasha talks about one of her one of her friends as a child who who disappeared, was found dead, shot in the head. This is a seven year old. This is the kind of thing that is going on. The children themselves are frequently molested. They are neglected. They are beaten. Actually, neglect is probably the best of all circumstances for them, because when the workers give them attention, it was often for physical molestation or abuse. And this is common. Sasha talks about, uh, it's very hard for me to hear as her father, but she talks about being drugged and being taken from the orphanage to another house. Again, we adopted Sasha just short of her 11th birthday. So we are talking a child. Sasha talks about how she would be drugged along with other children and wake up in this house where they knew not where they were and where the, they were sexually, sexually molested there. Money was being made off of them. These things are very, very real people. And how about the ones who graduate from the orphanages? Well, according to the Russian Interior Ministry's own estimates, and the Russian Interior Ministry, um, even post collapse of the Soviet Union still provided most of the statistics for what was going on in Ukraine. So tight was the relationship between those two countries. According to their own estimates, 30% of the so-called graduates are pushed out of the orphanages at age 16. 30% will enter a life of crime. 40% will become addicted to drugs or alcohol. And 60% of girls will become prostitutes. And that is because they end up in the hands of the mafia, pushed out onto the streets, nowhere really to go. The mafia says, hey, come here, give you a little money. Hey, I need you to do me a favor. See that guy over there? This is the sort of thing that goes on. 10% of those children will commit suicide. And as for the non-graduates in these orphanages, in Ukraine alone, 30% of those with severe disabilities will be dead by the age of 18. This is what happens to these children. But it's not just in Ukraine. I've seen it all over the world. And, uh, and, and not, by the way, because I, I was looking forward to doing a story on child sex trafficking. Uh, in, in pursuit of, a, of writing a book or perhaps a series of articles that take me to the third world, you end up encountering this in a very big way. It just, just incidentally. Now, much of the film takes place in Colombia, Cartagena, Colombia. And uh, I have been in Colombia, I don't know, maybe 10 times. I've, I've been in Cartagena probably the same number of times. And I want to say this about, the, about Colombia as a country. Colombia... 
Columbia quite rightfully had a horrible reputation with Americans because of Pablo Escobar and the drugs that were coming out of there. You know, all the 80s movies, some of the 90s movies that dealt with drug trafficking almost always dealt with, um, with, with the country of Colombia. It was one of the most dangerous countries of the world at the time. And yet, over the course of about the last 20 years, Colombia, which is a third world country, uh, very much a third world country, but Colombia has been making some remarkable strides to clean up its cities. Uh, Medellin, which was Pablo Escobar's city and w had one of the highest murder rates in the world in the 1980s and 1990s, is now one of the most beautiful cities in South America. Generally fairly safe, depending on where you go. In almost any city, you go to Birmingham, Alabama, you go to the wrong parts of the city at the wrong time, you can find yourself in trouble in a big hurry. But what has happened in Colombia in just the last year is that Marxists have taken over. This is a theme that we we discuss on this show from time to time, how, how Marxists are gradually, through, through bogus elections, are gradually taking over a lot of these countries in the, in the, uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Honduras, uh, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Brazil, and Chile, which was the most stable democracy in South America, have all been taken over by Marxist. And so I would say to you that if you're a savvy traveler, Colombia can be a very nice country uh, to visit. I don't want to trash the whole country because of something, that, a, a seedier element that is that is going on in the, uh, the sordid underbelly of that country. There's some very fine people and it is a city, it is a country that is worth visiting. However, Colombia has a, a history of deeply corrupt police and politicians. It's a very real, a very real thing. And if you go there, you need to know that. And if you're going there, uh, you can enjoy a beautiful hotel and you can enjoy a beautiful restaurant and you can enjoy a beautiful evening out, but you need to be careful and you need to know what you're doing. And much of the film, historically accurately, is taking place in Cartagena. Knowing a number of Colombian women, um, they can tell you some very harrowing stories of what life is like in a country like that for women, particularly attractive women. Ironically, in this film, again, no spoilers, in this film, the, the main baddie is a woman. She is a former Miss Cartagena. And this is factually correct. She was, I think, Miss Cartagena 2013. And she is the one who is running the child sex trafficking ring. She is the one that, that Tim Ballard, played by Jim Caviezel, they're trying to get. She's a real figure. She's a real person. She really exists. And the irony of this is that my son, Zachary, who is sitting off camera here, he dated for a time a former Miss Cartagena. Not to be confused with this woman. <laughs> Not to be confused with this woman. Uh, indeed, a very beautiful uh, a young woman who is uh, a, a very fine young lady. But she can tell you, this former Miss Cartagena can tell you some, some crazy stories of the things that happen to women in this country. That is a form of trafficking. It is a form of rape, all of these things that take place. She will tell you that she, you, she got into a taxi on one occasion and the driver turned around and sprayed her in the face with something that, that they call dragon's breath. Dragon's breath. You hear others talk about it in South America. And what they will describe is that they are conscious, but they're not really able to do anything. They find themselves to be fairly compliant. Someone will say to you, give me your wallet, and you hand it out, and you, you hand it to them. They just feel very, when they get sprayed with this. And the story she tells is she was sprayed in the face with some of this stuff. Next thing she knew, the, the, uh, the taxi driver was on top of her. And um, she managed to, um, to fight him off, to avoid being raped by this man, to fight him off. And she says the last thing she remembers, she was running down the street. She was running down the street. But she had taken a picture, which is wise to do. I never get into, in the third world, sometimes not even in, in um, major cities in Europe or the United States, without taking a picture of the taxi drivers. You know, so they usually have it on the, 
the uh, the visor. I usually take a picture of it. Sometimes it's in the back seat. It's posted. His name, his taxi number, and or the license plate. And the reason I do that is not because I'm getting in thinking somebody's going to you know drive me out to a field and try to shoot me. I do it just in case I leave my phone or I leave a backpack or I do something like that. It's very easy to do. And uh, and then what are you going to do? You know, there's a million taxis in Paris and you can't find the one that you were you were just in. But I also do it for safety reasons. And she had done this, and so she called the police to tell them what had happened to her. And she said they didn't care. They didn't do a thing. This is a story that is all too common. And she was a very, very young woman at the time that that happened to her. So the, these kinds of stories that CNN wants to say that this stuff isn't real, I promise you that it is. I've seen it all over the world. And there's also a kind of sex trafficking that isn't acknowledged as sex trafficking. And that is because the age of consent, do you have any idea what the age of consent is? in Colombia, throughout much of South America? 14. 14. To me, that's, that's, child, that's, that's, that's child sex trafficking. That is, um, that is rape. That is rape. And it is because uh, in that country, and I don't want to try to force my cultural norms on another country. However, the reason these children find themselves in these circumstances, usually, not always, but usually it is because their families are desperate for money. And so they linger around hotels that they know that Westerners frequent, hoping that some Westerner will pick them up. And, um, and you see walking around the hotels, you will see Westerners, often Americans, walking around with girls that you know are, by our standards, underage. And then that's the reason that they've come there. So this is, they, they refer to it as sexual tourism. This is what, what was that guy's name? Jared, you know, the, uh, the guy with, what, what's that restaurant? Subway. Subway. This is what he was arrested for that he was doing in Thailand. This is what was going on in Thailand. He was he was finding little girls on the internet and then going for these, these liaisons there. This kind of stuff is going on in, uh, uh, at, at, at an, an enormous scale throughout the world, throughout the third world, but particularly in South America. And there's another reason that children, and not just sex trafficking, children are often rented out for another purpose. And you know what that is? To get pity. When you're walking the streets almost anywhere in South America, you will find, you know, the, the problem of illegal immigrants, you know, crossing our border by the hundreds of thousands is happening throughout South America. And that is because people are fleeing Marxist hell holes. They're fleeing Marxist hell holes. And so these people are begging on the streets. And what you discover is, what they've discovered is that they have a better chance of getting your sympathy and thus your money if they have a child. So they will rent a child. Hey, can I have your child for the afternoon? And then put that child on their shoulder or a baby and come up to you and say, I need, I need to feed my child. They're, they, they're doing it in order to get sympathy. And I, I should also be very clear at this point, I'm not telling you not to give them money. I think you have to decide that. And for me, it's it's a matter of letting the Holy Spirit give me some wisdom in doing that. Indeed, I give out a lot of money. I carry pocket change just so I can do that. I keep it in, in one pocket and then I keep my real money in another pocket because you do not want to flash, you know, a lot of cash when you're in these countries. But can you pull out a five dollar, you know, five dollars will feed them for for a few days. I mean, you can go a long way with that and you can do a lot of good with that. But you also want to be clear that. I'm very careful that what you're not aiding is some kind of organized crime. There's that too. So children are being exploited throughout the world in a, in a variety of ways. And it's by the billions. I've seen it in Brazil. I've seen it in Panama. I've seen it, as I've already said, in Thailand. I've seen it in Davos. In Switzerland, World Economic Forum. I should specify that what's going on there, which made some headlines with, say, the Daily Mail and some others who had the guts to cover it, is that prostitutes were being flown into Davos to meet the 
demand of the billionaires who are coming for the World Economic Forum. And I want to make a distinction here. I'm not aware of any children who are being brought in for that. Um, I'm not aware of that happening. Many rumors of that happening, but I'm not aware of any factual hard evidence that that actually was taking place. And I don't want to be a child here. I mean, what I'm condemning here is what goes on with children, the exploitation of children. There are parts of the world where prostitution is legal. And, you know, what happens between consenting adults who make a transaction, I'm not trying to force my morality on those people in those circumstances. Those are adults making adult choices. What we're talking about here is child sex trafficking, which is a different thing. And it doesn't just happen, again, in the third world. How many of you have ever heard of the Rotherham sex scandal? I know you have because, um, you know, I'm your dad. So you've, you've seen, seen me write about it many times and have discussions with uh, members of the London Times regarding it. Are you familiar with it, Jonathan? No. See, and that's typical. Most people haven't heard of it. And that's shocking to me. Listen to this. The the Rotherham is a, is a city in England where it was uncovered by the, by the terrific, I've, I've said a lot here today about lousy journalists, by the, by the fantastic journalists at the uh, Times, not the New York Times, but the Times of London. And um, journalist Andrew Norfolk did a terrific bit of, um, of investigative reporting there because he was hearing from child... Um, social workers, that something was going on in that city and something enormous was going on in that city. And furthermore, that it was, it was highly organized, that it involved taxi drivers, police, government officials, uh, restaurateurs, others who were involved in the trafficking of children. And here's what he said in his in his report, confidential police reports and intelligence files reveal a hidden truth about the sale and extensive use of English children for sex. They show that for more than a decade, organized groups of men were able to groom, pimp, and traffic girls across the country with virtual impunity. Offenders were identified to police, but not prosecuted. Not prosecuted. A child welfare expert speaking under condition of anonymity, said that agencies' reluctance to tackle such street grooming networks was, quote, the biggest child protection scandal of our time. The Times has published several articles about a pattern of crimes across northern England and the Midlands involving groups of men largely of Pakistani heritage, that is, Muslims, and the sexual abuse of white girls aged from 12 to 16. This was taking place in Rotherham. He goes on to say that it was taking place on an industrial scale. Astonishing. According to the Independent, 19,000 British children, all white, were sex trafficked in 2019 alone. 19,000 of them. Says the independent headline, grooming epidemic as almost 19,000 children identified as sexual exploitation victims in England. To date, almost no one has gone to jail for this. Why didn't the girls tell anyone? Many of them did. Telling their teachers, telling their parents in some cases, and telling social workers who, for the most part, did nothing. Often the police themselves were told and they dismissed it as a bunch of nothing. One girl reports being taken out by, by these sex gangs, by these Muslims, being taken out into the countryside where they dumped gasoline on her head and a guy held a lighter and said, if you tell anyone, do you know what's going to happen to you? The British public was looking the other way because of political correctness because they did not want to be called Islamophobes. Uh, they were frightened of being called racist and they did nothing as their children were being raped. It's still going on. And almost no one has been prosecuted. There should be executions for this. A lot of them. For anybody who was involved in this, even on the periphery.
who was involved in this. Not happening. And it turned out that what was happening in Rotherham was just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Similar sex gangs were discovered in multiple cities all across England. And they have since been discovered all across Europe. And that brings us to Hollywood and to powerful elitists in the United States. There are a lot of people who have suggested Jim Caviezel has been attacked because he has suggested that there are Hollywood elites who are involved in this, that there are powerful people high up in American society who are involved in sex trafficking on the wrong side of the sex trafficking. They're the customers, you know, Epstein Island type people. And Caviezel said yesterday that Epstein Island is not the only island where this kind of stuff is going on. It's going on other places too. It's going on offshore. Some people keep their money offshore. These people keep their children offshore. It's happening in other places. Am I saying that these networks exist in Hollywood? I don't know. But what I will tell you is that if a scandal, the scale of Rotherham could be hidden from public view for a decade with that many people involved, it does not stretch the imagination to think that there are similar similar um, operations running in the United States as Jim Caviezel suggests. And Tim Ballard, the two of them have been you know, going around doing the... Uh, the obligatory interviews and uh, and discussing these things. And they're, they're getting trashed for even suggesting that this sort of thing is going on. And what makes it much more believable to me is that our president of the United States is not Reagan. We are governed by pedophiles. Joe Biden is a pedophile. He's a pedophile. When you see Joe Biden sniffing children, we all know he is a pedophile. Some of you will say, well, but he isn't. We know from Ashley Biden's diary, which we know is legitimate, that he required, he, he forced his adolescent daughter to have showers with him. She says that just before he ran for president, he came to ask her for forgiveness. So when you see this, you know the kind of individual that he is. And there's a recent one here where he's kind of going wah, 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 to, a, to a girl. You might have seen this. It's, it's creepy, creepy, creepy. There was a time when you would see, let's say, a Reagan or a, you know, a, a Franklin Delano Roosevelt or a Truman or, or a, a Jimmy Carter who might do those things with children. You just see that as completely normal. And, and not only just normal, but you see it as appropriate. That's somebody who likes children. Now to even say that you like children is to imply some kind of sordid thing. And parents themselves react to this this way. That is the devil's work, not just in the actual perversion, but the perversion changing, altering what is rightful and proper interaction between human beings. This is where we find ourselves. So given that we have a government that is pushing every kind of sexual perversion, transgenderism, the, the, uh, the irreversible sex change surgeries on children, uh, pushing it in schools, um, drag shows for adolescents. Is it difficult to believe that a government that pushes that kind of garbage, that kind of evil, that they are involved in child sex trafficking? Not at all hard to believe. It's totally consistent with who they are. So hence the memo to the media elites to say, hey, minimize this, call it QAnon. And they all dutifully comply with the exception of Variety. Variety apparently did not get the memo, <laughs> but everyone else, it seems, did. And so they have been trashing the media. But there are also other reasons why they would seek to minimize child sex trafficking. They want to keep you focused on the things that they want to keep you focused on. They want you focused on climate and uh, uh, your gas stove and your carbon footprint and white supremacy. They dare not risk that a movie like this divert your attention to something that is real. They keep holding up the shiny object. Look at this, look at this, look at this. This is the thing you need to be concerned about. White supremacy, QAnon. When the real issues are going on over here, it is 
sleight of hand. But there's also a progression here, and it's one that I keep driving home on this podcast to you, the posse. By the way, that's what I've decided to call you. The people of you who follow this this podcast, um, who appear in the the north of 10,000 comments. I try to keep up. I do my best, but it's it's very, very difficult to do that, especially with bots, you know, crashing, you know, the comments. But I still try to do that. I, I told you on a previous podcast I was going to give you a name. I have. You are the posse. Together, we are that dust cloud that is following the bad guys and the culture, and we're following the ideas that drive them. And something you've heard me say before, By the way, if there's something that you want to read, a lot of you are asking for book recommendations. I urge you to read Romans 1 again and again and again. It's a chapter that the first time through, you're not going to fully get it. Romans 18, uh, 118 through 32, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Read that again and again and again. Back up just a little bit. Go to verse 16 through 32 and internalize it. Think on it. What is Paul there saying. But Romans 1 says that a that godlessness leads to a devaluation of life and a perversion of life, eventually an attack on life itself. That's where we are. You don't think that your worldview matters? It does. You drive God out of the uh, the culture, which has been happening. Christianity has been leaking from the culture like a <laughs> like a slow leak in a tire. It's been it's been leaking from the culture for decades now. And now we're starting to see what the results of that are. Godlessness leads to a devaluing of life, a perversion of life, and then an attack on life itself. Now, many have expressed shock at how the media has attacked this film. But it isn't the film per se that is their primary target. Children are the targets. More to the point, the sanctity of a child's life. Now consider this Times, again, Times of London headline. The same Times of London that exposed the Rotherham sex scandal also published this, which is embarrassing. And here's the headline. Kids are cute, but they're not really eco-friendly. Kids are cute, but they're not really eco-friendly. Human beings are the enemies to the radical environmentalists. They are the enemies to the radical left. They are the enemies to the World Economic Forum. They are the enemies to the ruling classes. Human beings and children don't have them. They don't want you to have them. Sometimes you people, um, the posse wants to ask me, what can we do? Have kids, love them, raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's one of the things that you can do. Populate this earth with with fine people who will make a difference. Have children. Don't be afraid to have children. Don't these people breed themselves out of existence. Um, kids are cute, but they're really not echo friendly. This is the way they think. And a film like this, which is a juggernaut at the box office, has the potential to launch a movement that not only demands action on child sex trafficking, but on a host of other child welfare issues. And that means risking the unholy sacrament of the radical child-hating left, which is what? Abortion. Abortion. Consider this, this meme right here. I saw this. I saw this online. A guy looks horrified. Looks like the scream. And he's looking at a dead dolphin while right behind him is a dead baby. But he's not looking at the baby. He doesn't care about. He doesn't care about the baby. Let me tell you a story of an interaction I had with somebody who was very high ranking in uh, planned parenthood. And uh, it was not a conversation I really wanted to have, but it was a conversation that I needed to have due to a, um, a transaction. And uh, anyway, this person started telling me about how much they loved armadillos. Armadillos. Uh, On my ranch, armadillos were a bane of horses, of cattle on a ranch because they they dig holes. Um, They're vile creatures. They're nasty troglodytes. Just hate them. And uh, so we'd shoot them every opportunity we get. They also carry leprosy which is another thing not to like about them. If you've ever seen an armadillo, they're, they're grotesque. Anyway, this person was talking to me. Now, again, high-ranking in Planned Parenthood. 
He kills babies for a living. But he's telling me about how much he likes rats, armadillos, how cute they are, the little babies. Aren't they so cute, so adorable? And I couldn't resist, uh, I couldn't resist saying to him, you know, my German Shepherd Ranger loves to kill armadillos. And he does. He absolutely lives to kill armadillos. And, um, and I'm to let him kill all that he wants. Apparently dogs don't get leprosy as a result of this, but it's, it's the meme that you see right here. Somebody who is horrified by the death of an animal, but isn't particularly bothered by children dying. And and you see this all over social media. It will show somebody risking their life to save a dog, and it gets gazillions of likes and retweets. And I say this, by the way, as somebody who likes animals. Not all animals don't like armadillos. I would be happy if the crocodile and um, black mama population was completely eradicated from the planet. However, roaches too. Spiders, we'll add them as well. But I like animals, generally speaking. I love my dog. I enjoy cats. I enjoyed every pet that I've ever had. But I don't value them the same as I value a human being. And someone will tell a story or will post something about abortion. It gets some likes and retweets. But you post somebody, you know, risking their life to save a dog from a river, and it'll get a million retweets. I mean, it's, it's insanity. And this also is Romans 1. Romans 1 says that it leads to the, the suppression of belief in God eventually leads to the worship of animals, of creeping things, of birds and animals and creeping things is the way that he puts it. This is where we are. And all of this, of course, is very revealing of who they are, who the media is, that people would seek to suppress what this is all about. Minimize the evil of child sex trafficking. And all of this comes back to a theme that I've been seeking to drive home with you, the posse. The goal is depopulation. This is a war on humanity in the name of the greater good for the planet and for sustainability. Recall my podcast on the World Economic Forum. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Recall my podcast on Bill Gates. If you haven't seen it, watch it. What was the singular theme of both? Depopulation. Recall how we showed you in the podcast on Bill Gates, a commercial by si uh, Simmons, I think is their name. Was it Simons or Simmons? Anyway, uh, a fashion retailer in Canada that put out an ad about how wonderful it is to kill yourself. Suicide's wonderful. It's like the old song for, you know, the, the TV show MASH, Suicide is Painless. It's wonderful to kill yourself. But watch this little video. This is Kamala Harris just this past week. And let's listen to what she has to say here. When we invest in clean energy and electric vehicles and reduce population, more of our children can breathe clean air and drink clean water. Now, Kamala Harris is too big of an idiot to come up with that on her own. She's told to say that. It is it is, it is showing you that the Biden administration has made depopulation a sacrament. It is a major driver for them. And then you have a New York Times headline that says this, pedophilia, a disorder, not a crime. Are you starting to see the bigger picture here of why major media would downplay a film like Sound of Freedom and child sex trafficking because they're in on it? And they're, if, if they're not actively engaging in it, they are running interference for it. That is what they are doing. Now, I want to close with this thought. Over the course of my life, I have regrets. You will, you will have regrets if you live long enough. But for me, having children has never been one of them. If I could, I had more. I'm now at a stage in life where I'm enjoying my three granddaughters. And just for the first time, uh, we had all three. They're all very small. Um, we had them all here just last week, had them all together. And what a joy that was. I'm starting to, um, to really appreciate having grandkids. Now, the fact is my daughter, Sasha, has left little Abby Kate with us for the last few days. 
that reminds me of parenting. And, uh, you know, we do that for a few days so they can go to the beach, but I'm ready to hand them back, <laughs> you know, because it's time for her to do the heavy lifting of that sort of thing. But the point is, we do love our children and we love our grandchildren. And it's been such a joy to watch them all flourish. They're all very interesting people. Sasha and her three brothers, they're all very interesting people. And now seeing grandchildren just makes things that more interesting to me. A nation, ladies and gentlemen, that does not value and protect its children. Indeed, a nation that actively seeks to pervert and destroy them, destroy their souls, is a nation that has no future. A decade ago, in an article that I wrote on the Jerry Sandusky sex scandal, remember Jerry Sandusky was the defensive coordinator under Joe Paterno at Penn State University for their football team. I predicted that there would come a time where guys like Jerry Sandusky and Larry Nasser, who you know abused the gym gymnasts at uh, Michigan State, that they would come to be seen as victims of heteronormativity, that they would be seen as people who, not as pedophiles, but as the way the New York Times puts it, as just minor attracted persons. This is what they want to call it nowadays, child attracted persons. They would be seen as individuals who are just acting on their normal impulses. We're there, ladies and gentlemen, we're there. You ask me again, what can you do? Well, you can minister to children. You can have children. You can raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because there is a global war on children. I'm reminded of a line from Boris Pasternak's Dr. Chivago, where he says this, it's always struck me as very po powerful. It's the way he ends that novel. One day, Laura went out and did not come back. She must have been arrested in the streets as so often happened in those days. And she died or vanished somewhere, forgotten as a nameless number on a list which later was mislaid. These children are just nameless numbers on a list which has been mislaid. They're simply statistics. And so you can minister to children. You can minister to your grandchildren. You can minister to your own children. You can adopt children. There's a need for that. You can get involved in ministries, authentic ministries, which help children. But you say, what can I do? Just one person. I leave you with this quotation from the, day, the great missionary, David Livingston, who said this, I found that I have no unusual endowment of intellect, but this day I resolved that I shall be an uncommon Christian.